Great. So in our last meeting, we considered and look at the qualitative characteristics of financial statements. We said that the financial statement that we are going to prepare, it should possess some qualities. It should possess some attributes, some features. What are they? There are two broad classifications. The very first one, we talk about the fundamental. So the first one is about fundamental. Good. And then we also have enhancing. So these two are the qualitative characteristics. In our previous meeting, we look at the first aspect of the fundamental. Fundamental, there are two. Enhancing, there are four. So fundamental, there are two. The first one on the list is what? Faithful representation. Faithful representation. Number two is relevance. Then you come to be the enhancing. Enhancing to their four in number. Enhancing their four in number. So one, two, three, four. Good. First one is understandability. understandability second one is all the et et verifiability right the next one is comparability all the et et comparable then the last one is timeliness so timeliness so these are the qualitative characteristics of financial statements. The financial statement that you are preparing or you are going to prepare or you are presenting it to the users, it should possess all these attributes. This one is fundamental because they make the financial statement useful. So any, any quality, that make the financial statements useful is called fundamental and they are two in number faithful presentation and relevance that is all they also have the enhancing which we have all these four under it now in our previous lecture we look at the faithful presentation and we did finish it so in this lecture we will continue from relevance and clear the remaining four of the enhancing that is the game good so when you talk about relevance what are we referring to relevance great so now let's put relevant aside and talk about him so relevant we are going to talk about Relevant. Now, don't tell us that the financial statement that we print must be relevant. If not said anything. Relevant simple means the financial statement that uh, we are preparing or the information that we are presenting, it should be able to provide all the decision needs of the user or influence the decision need of the user. That is all. So the information that we are going to provide it must so the financial information that we are providing must influence so influence the decision for the decisions of the user the decisions of the user or 
it must provide all the decision needs of the user. It must provide all the decision needs of the user. I like that. So that means if you are there and you ask maybe your subordinates to prepare some information for you, you ask the person to bring some documents for some decision. So the person brought a document here. You went through and said, oh, no, the other one. So that means this one is not relevant enough. You need extra one. Good. So it means that this one does not, will not help you to make all your decisions. This one alone will not influence you. Good. So that is the relevant that we are talking about that. Make sure that before you submit any document, any financial statement to the users, make sure that whatever that will help them make decision has been included. That is all. Okay. So basically, that is what we refer to as as what the relevance. Good. Okay, so now we have certain ingredients that enhance the relevancy of the account. So here, relevant simple means whatever you are sending to the users or the owners, make sure that it provides all the decision needs. Don't send information and still call you on phone that, please, uh, can we get this one? Do you have this one there? Oh, I need, the, I need this information. So that in whatever you provided is what is irrelevant. So come and take it away. Good. So that is it. Okay. Now, we cannot define or explain relevance without giving reference to that of materiality. Materiality. How do you know that this information is relevant so I should include it in the financial statement? How do you know that this information, the users need it to make their decision? How do you know that this information will affect or will influence the decision needs of the users? How do you know? You know this or you assess this based on the materiality level. So let's see materiality. Is a term that we should understand it very well. So let me see if I can put it somewhere here. Materiality. Materiality. So so materiality. Now, before we explain or define materiality, let's see this. There are some team, and I, in that team, there's one particular person. When the person, uh, let's take soccer team. If there's a particular person, when that person is on the field or among the team, the team will perform very well. So when that person is what among included, so included, the team that day, the team will, will perform very well. If that person two is omitted or excluded from the team, that day they will score them. They will not perform well. Again, the same person, if you change the person's position, Maybe he was uh, number nine, eh? and I say she go and then play, let's say ten, or she go to the five, the center. No, or he normally moves from left to right. 
So if you ask me to move from right to left, you have distorted the guy's plan. So such a person is what? Material. So anytime I'm going to play, make sure that that people are on board. Because the least mistake you do and you not bring them, uh, users to make a different decision. Oh, they will score them and true true, they will score you. Now let's use this. Now let's come back to financial statement preparation. The financial statement that we have prepared, mm -hmm. there are some particular information. When I include it, when I include that information, the owners or the users will think differently. They will assume differently. Again, if I exclude it, they will also think different. The same information, though, if I bring it in, they will think different. If I exclude it too, they also make a different decision. Any assumption will be different. Number three, if I misstate it, assume that it was, let's say, 30,000 and I, I recorded 40. They will also what, take a different decision. So such information is what is material. That is the materiality. So we are saying that all material transactions are automatic relevant to report on all material transaction. Material that can make difference. So I normally call this one shaky. Items or the transaction that can shake what the users, they are the material. The items that, that can make difference, they can stand alone, they are significant, they are of importance, they are of great value, they are relevant. So we have to what, report on them. Good. So now that is the meaning of materiality. So if they ask you, normally, uh, some books can be like this. Information is material, if it's omission, our misstatement could reasonably distort the economic decision made by what the users. That is the definition for the materiality. Now, how do you know that this information or this transaction is material? How do you assess the materiality level of a transaction? Okay, good. How do you know that this item is of important great value so i have to I have to include it now you can assess the materiality based on what nature or the size so let's start with the size you also call it quantum that's the value the size so let's assume that the company where your annual sales revenue, annual sales revenue is around 4192 million US dollars. So this is your annual revenue, your sales revenue. Sales, your annual sales is 4,192 million US dollars. So if I should probably state it fully, that's 4.2 billion dollars. Okay. And there was someone the whole year, the person managed to pick away um, thousand dollars. Is it material? Is of great important will it make a difference if i include this thousand as a loss that somebody else taking away thousand will it make a difference if i exclude it will it also make a difference if i make it two thousand make a difference that is the maturity level now if you check this one is 4.2 billion this one is thousand dollars so probably this is what immaterial looking at the size because if I should write this one, this figure in full, then you look like this, six zeros. And the person just picked $1,000, just $1,000 like here. So 
does not even have any impact on the amount. So such transactions is what immaterial. So this thousand Ghana is what immaterial. Sorry, thousand dollars is immaterial. Good. So that is it. Now, what if the person was a professional thief, qualified thief, professional, have a, over 15 years experience? So he managed to create a fictitious account within the company where every day, thousand Ghana cities is moved from the company's account to that fictitious account, calling it Petty. So every day, thousand dollars. So in a year, how much will it be? So a year, so total. If every day we have 365 days, so it will be 365,000 US dollars. Uh, this is material. 365,000 dollars is what is material. So here we can say that, okay. For some of the transaction or this transaction individually is not material, but aggregate, putting everything together, it might be material. Okay, putting everything together, it might be material. That is why in audit, after, before you issue your audit opinion, you check that all oh, the material errors that you discovered or all the errors that you discovered, those are not those are immaterial. You sum them up and see whether they will be material. Maybe five CD missing somewhere, ten dollars missing somewhere, fifty dollars missing somewhere, hundred dollars. Check the frequency. If you have let's say about two thousand five hundred or fifty dollars missing, so multiply two thousand five hundred by fifty. So you realize that individual fifty dollars might not be material but putting together 2500 times so that one becomes material then we are done okay now the second type is this second type is nature how the transaction took place can also be deemed or determine the maturity level of that transaction how the transaction took place, how the transaction took place, the nature. Some of the transaction, they have automatic material rights due to their nature. So automatic, for instance, but that measures and acquisitions, such transactions are material by nature, not by the amount. So if, it, for instance, look at Airtel to go. When Airtel to go merge, measure an acquisition, that doesn't that Airtel spent, let's say, um, five dollars. Tigo also spent um, seven dollars, and then now they merge. So now they are called them eighty Airtel to go. Now, five and seven dollars, we are just assuming you know, that they spend five and seven dollars. Just an assumption. Five and seven dollars is immaterial. But looking at the nature, they are combining business. Two different entities are coming. So this one is material. And it must be in the financial statement. I will, I'll be get it. Good. Now, another example is my theft. Stealing. It's material, Baba. That's the. Let me uh, give you an example in real life. Why is it that when you are walking, probably in the streets, and then you just said, thief, thief, or juror, what do you do? You turn back and go and meet the person. You didn't even ask how much the person picked, whether it was 50 pesos or 50 cents or 50 pence. You just rush to the person and go and meet the person. Why? Because the person of picking someone's phone or someone's item. So it tells you that stealing is mm, automatic. But I tell you, like, maybe it didn't pick up. It was an attempt to steal. But because it's material, it must be what recorded. So that's why 
you normally rush and then beat them before you ask them what is taken from you. So I'm done with the relevance. That is the end of relevance. So we say relevance, basically we are saying that make sure that you include all information that will help the user to make his decision. That's all. Now let's start with the enhancing. Enhancing qualitative characteristics. I'll start with the understandability. Understandability. So let's single understandability here. Understandability. Here yeah, we are saying that the financial statement or the financial information that we are presenting, it must be readily understood by who? The users. For that matter, users must have a reasonable knowledge about the operations and the financial affairs of the entity. So here we are saying that the financial statement, the users must easily go through and then understand them to make decision. So if you're an accountant or a preparer and you prepare a financial statement that no one else can go through or no one else can make meaning out of it. No one else can understand except you. Either you know all the representations, like most of the figures, like if you use your um, alphabet that is familiar to you to represent them. So like administrative expense, make it A, distribution, make it D, sales, it just S. Uh, it will be very easy for them to understand. Good. Now the issue is this. Yeah, we are saying that the financial statement must be presented the most simplest way to help users to understand it and make meaning out of it. Good. Now, we have constraint that normally are fed up understandability. You know, sometimes the complex transactions are not easy to be understood. Complex what transactions? Some of the transactions they are complex. It's not easy. Good. So it doesn't mean that those complex transactions we have to ignore. Those complex transactions. No, we have to record this. As long as material, it must be recorded in the books. Okay. So that is the understandability. Let's go to verifiability. I like verifiability. I'll tell you why I like it. Verifiability simple means the financial information that we are preparing or presenting to the users, it must be easily be checked or authenticated by a third party, usually the auditors. So someone else should be able to go through without facing any key challenges. So that is it. The financial statement must be easily verified by a third party, the auditors. So here, if you prepare a financial statement that no one else can go through or check and make meaning out of it, then that's not a good financial statement. Okay. Now let me tell you why I like it. In exams, if you're writing a paper base, it means that your answers that you produce on your answer booklet, it must also be what easily verifiable. Most of the examiners have complained severely that they can't see. They can't see most of the answers. Good. So verifiability means in exams too, the answers that you give to the examiner, 
make sure that he can go through. Okay, so that's fine. Now let's go to comparability. 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 That means the financial statement that we are presenting, it must be easily be understood. Good. So the financial statement must be easily compared to other entities' financial statement. Sorry. So if you present the financial information to the users, make sure that they can compare whatever you presented to them to the other financial statements to make meaning out of it. To make meaning out of it. Okay. So basically, now let's see. So that means any financial statement that you present to the users, make sure that they can compare to, to obtain what performance. This is in the interpretation of financial statement. We will probably look at it. Okay. Now, to enable compatibility, two things must be in place. To enable compatibility, to make compatibility look good, there must be two things. Okay, so let's see. To enable compatibility, we say one, there must be a consistency or uniformity. Here, you must be consistent with the accounting policy once selected or adopted. Make sure that your principles, your basis, your assumptions, you stick to them. You don't need to change them. To enable compatibility, do not stick. Then, second, there must be disclosure. Disclosure. Tell us what has happened during the year. Disclose all the items to us. Now let's give an example why we need the disclosure. Now when I give you two companies, company A and company B, and I write profit after tax year, 50, and let's say 30. So which of these two companies are doing well? Which of these two companies is doing well? Which of this? So here, yeah, if you look at the face, it will tell me that company B is not doing well, A is doing well. Now, if I weigh the case and then inform you that A entered into, B entered into investment during the year and had invested all, all his proceeds, or all his available investment in that project and hoping that exactly six months later that project will make a good profit. So 
the tadi. Nah, in that case, then the company be in New York. Yeah, I said that the investment, and then do the year is all the money for investment. So that tells the company A is doing well because aside investment. Good. Okay. So that is the comparability. Before you can do comparison well, make sure that there's consistency between the accounting policy. There's disclosure requirements. That's all. Great. So basically, that is the comparability. Then you go to timeliness. Here we are saying that the financial statement must be on time. Not too early, not too late. Must be on time. So we are now with the content number three. Let's go to content number four. Content number four. Content number four. Content number four. So content number four probably talks about the element of the financial statement. Element of FX measure capital. The element of the financial statement. Now we are saying that what are the elements of the financial statement? This is different from the component of financial statement or the consequence of financial statement. These two terms are not the same. They are different. Elements of the financial statement. And the components of financial statement. Element means what are the items that we will find on the financial statement. That's all. Here, the items that we have to report on are real. So we have to see real items. So tell the examiner that the items are real. So if I pick any financial statement, I will see what revenue. I will see what here is square because they are two. First one, I will see expenses. Or expense. I will see equity. I will also see assets, right? And finally, I will see liability. Now I'll add the last one to it. So um, if I add it to the real. Normally change the position. So gains and losses. Gains and losses. The total part. Gains and losses. So these are the elements of the financial statement. Elements of the financial statement. Elements of the financial statement. Please and please again, you should know the definition and the explanation of all these elements. That is all. That is all. You should know them. Some of them will not ask you. Only one pair that you normally ask. 
So I'll scan through all of them, their definitions, and then their actual meaning, because in the financial reporting, we said it's about preparation and presentation of financial statements. So we are going to use this most often. We are going to talk about them. So you know what they are so that we can freely use them. Now, when you talk about revenue, what is it? What is revenue? Revenue. Revenue is what an income from an ordinary cost of business. That is the meaning of revenue. It's in a form of what sales. Examples of revenue are sales, fees, what again? Receipts, subscriptions, that is revenue. Like what you use in is an income coming from your ordinary course of business. So for instance, if you are a petty trader, you buy and sell maybe tomato. Revenue means tomato that is money coming from sales of tomatoes. Let's assume that you are an educational institute, like Target Professional Institute, TPI. Our major revenue would be what? Fees. We don't sell anything. The revenue is fees. So I don't know here, when we put our financial statements, you will see fees, not sales. So take note that not every company on this earth will have sales as revenue, not at all. Not at all. Check banks or financial institutions. They will have what? Interest. Interest receive or interest income. But that's what they do in. That is revenue. So revenue simple means money coming from what you do in. That's what ends there. Or agent commission. 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 Can be deemed as revenue. Why? If I am a, I've registered my business to be an agent of someone, sell goods on behalf of someone, that's my principal activity. That's what I do. Is so come on to revenue. So that is it. so revenue. I just money coming in. What about income? Income simple means increase in assets as a result of what inflow or in a form of inflow good. Now let's go to expenses. Expenses simple means decrease in assets as a result of what? Outflow or consumption of service. So expenses means decrease in what? Asset in a form of, in a form of one, Outflow to consumption of service. Consumption of service. Good. That is expense. I'll come to you with you later because it's the top one guy. So we are now with what expense. I'll come to you with you. Don't put a salary there. Let's come to assets. For assets, uh, you've gone through it, so you know the definition already. Asset we are saying that is what? Economic resources, owned and controlled by an entity for which future economic benefits is expected to flow to the entity, or that result and inflow of economic benefits. That's all. Liability, directly opposite. That is a present obligation arising from past events from which future government is expected to move out of the entity. Or that will result what an outflow of future economy. Now let me go to everything. What everything? Everything. 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 Everything.
Before I define equity, what is the accounting equation? Asset is equal to equity plus what? Liability. Can you make equity the subject for me? So if you make equity the subject, what do you get? So liability come. Asset minus liability is equal to what? Equity. Great. Perfect. So equity is equal to asset minus what? Liability. Asset minus liability. So this guy came here and it was like that. So I cannot write it well. That equity is equal to what? Asset minus liability. Okay. Now, if it's like this, now what is equity? Define equity for me. So anywhere the examiner asks you, now what is equity? You just asset minus liability, that's all. Equity, the definition is asset minus liability. So we said that equity is the residual interest after deducting all, all liabilities from all assets, that is all. So residual interest after deducting all liabilities from all assets, that is equity. So something that left. Residual interest. Residual means like leftover. It can be a chance. It can be a something, whatever left. Let's give it to the person. So equity is the leftover. After we taken all our abilities from our asset, that's the leftover. So that's equity. Good. That's the definition. Okay. Now this one, they ask them to define it on the settings. That is between 2018 November and then 2019. There's another ask them to define equity. Good. So that is it. Now we are done. We are done with the definition and we know the element, we know equity too. Now let's go to the next chapter or the next section. The next section talks about recognition of the element. Now, each of the elements have its own recognition, and there are specific standards that provide recognition. So that one, I'll not touch it. I'll not talk about it. No, I'll not touch it at all. Why? Because there's a standard that provides specific recognition criteria. So when we reach there, I'll look at it. Good. Just that revenue have its own recognition. Recognition simple means I go to record that transaction in the books, that's enough recognition. And in financial reporting, before that item would be recorded on a financial statement or recorded in the financial statement or in the books of accounts, it must pass some test or it must meet certain conditions. So you call it recognition criteria or condition. That should be satisfied. All these items have conditions. That must be there before you can record it. So those conditions are very important. Yeah, that when you pick each of every item, we'll look at it. However, equity does not have a recognition criteria. Everybody has a step towards equity. So I remember one of the settings, we asked them, the question goes like this. Define equity and explain why there's no recognition criteria for equity. That was the question. So first, define equity and explain why there's no recognition criteria. That is all. So we have to define equity. Tell them that it's asset minus liability. So equity is nothing by asset minus liability. That's the first one. Second. Why is it that um, equity, we don't have any recognition criteria? Why? Because equity is not on its own. Equity is not on its own. It picks its value from the changes in what? From the changes in asset and liability. So equity is not on its own. So it means that equity does not 
depend on its own, but it depends on what asset and liability. Everything depends on asset and liability. That is why we don't have recognition criteria. So it's like if it depends on someone, when that person moves, it will move. It's like you move with a school bus for a program. Why have that bus been parked? That's into the end of the program. Or whoever you watch, every minute you turn and watch whether that bus is there. You see people going towards there, you to go there. That means you don't have recognition. Of yes, because you didn't go there on your own. That is what we are referring to. I'm done with the recognition. The remaining ones, all of them have recognition. We will talk to them one after the other in the IFRSs, in the standards. So we have some few revenue standards. Their leader is the IFRS 15. We go to asset standard, expenses standard, or performance standard. We go to liability standards. Then we look at them. We are done. Let's go to the last but one item for us to finish the conceptual framework. Last but one item for us to finish the conceptual framework. Okay. The last one is called measurement. Measurement. So measurement. of the element of the elements in the financial statement. It's not for capital. Now measurement simple means how do you obtain the value to be placed on the items in the financial statement? That is the meaning of measurement. Measurement means how do you arrive about the value? The red the word recognition. Recognition. Simple means I go to report. I go to reflect it. I go to include. That's the meaning of what recognition. Measurement means now after you have satisfied the recognition criteria. Oh yes, I will record it. Oh yes, that's satisfied the recognition for asset. And at what value? That's the measurement. What value are you going to place on it? Oh, it must be at the cost of 5,000. Oh, no. It must be at the end of 3,000. That is the measurement. Okay. Now, the conceptual framework provides general measurement. We call it measurement after the initial measurement. The conceptual framework provides a general measurement, about four in number. I write all of them here. They are four in number. Good. So I write all of them in there. Good. They are four in number. And if you pick each of them, you should know one, how do you measure assets? Two, how do you measure liability? That is all. How do you measure assets? How do you measure liability? So let's look at them one after the other. If I pick the first one, that's the historical cost. Historical cost. Historical cost. Now, under this type of measurement, as the name suggests, history, past recorded figure, the assets, the transaction or asset must be recorded as what the original cost, the amount incurred to acquire the asset. That is it, the amount incurred to acquire the asset. Good.
So here we have to use the original value of that transaction. So always you have to state that original value. So here, when you mention them, just know that asset, what is the value? Liability, what is the value? That's all. All the measurement bases. They tell us how we should measure asset and liability. That's a popular one. How she measure what asset and liability. So if you take asset, for instance, here, here asset, you have to use the original cost at impaired to acquire the asset. So original, original cost, original cost incurred to acquire the asset. If a detailed explanation has been done in the material. So when you get this, you can have the full version. What about liability? Liability to must be stated at a cash and cash equivalent required to settle them at the normal cost of business. So cash. Cash required. <laughs> To settle, to settle, to settle um, at what an ordinary cost. Good. Cash required to settle them. As in an ordinary cost of what? Cost of business. That's all. So this under this method, can we use the original? The original. Go back. History. Go back and go use the original figure. That is all. That is all what we are talking about here. We are now with the historical cost. With the historical cost. The current value is irrelevant. So here, when uh, we are done, we'll look at some few illustrations. Okay. Now let's move on to the next measurement. We also have what we call current cost. There are four in number, it's more of them. Current cost. So as the name suggests, current, current, today, today, today. The value to do. Oh, use the value to do. Don't use the stock car value. No. So here we want the value. The asset or the liability must be stated at their current value. That is all. At their current value. Asset or the liability must be stated at their current value. Full stop. Must be stated at their current value. So so as usual, the right answer, just the explanation, how they must be stated, liability, how they must be stated. So asset must be stated at their current value. So asset must be that what current purchase price, purchase price or fair value or the market value. Are the same current purchase price or the fair value or the market value that is what you have to state. Liability you have to state it at undiscounted cash flow required to settle them currently. So I can say that amount, amount currently required to settle them. To settle the lab, to settle the lab. So that means if you owe someone ten million US dollars, and the person said today, today, come and pay two million, so that everything, forget about everything. So that means the current value of the liability is what two million. Or you owe somebody. 10 million now, the liability, the value is, the value has increased currently up to 15 million. 
you have this data to what 15 million. That is it. so that is how we we'll look at it. Now let's move on to the next one, the last back one. So that is it. Current cost. Asset must be said that their current purchase value or fair value or the market value. Now let's go to the third one. Third one will be uh, we call it net uh, realizable value or settlement value. So realizable value. Realizable or settlement value. Settlement value. As the name suggests, settlement value. As the name suggests, settlement value. As the name suggests, settlement value. Now, this one goes to asset. This is for asset. This one is for asset. This one is for liability. That's all. So third examiner that the liabilities must be stated at their settlement value amount required to settle them at the normal cost of business then realizable asset must be stated at the amount that we can realize from it when we sell realize we save when we sell the asset that's all so realizable goes to the asset settlement goes to liability so that's what we call it Realizable or settlement value. Amount that we can generate if you sell the asset today. So if I have an asset that you bought it 20 years ago at the cost of 30, currently the market price or the fair value is at 25. But if you sell this asset today, you will get only 20. So if you are using the realizable value, you state it at 20. If I use historical cost 30, if I use current 25, that's what we are talking about. The last one, the last one, the only four measurement basis that we should know them. This one's like general, not specific. Good. The specific ones are in our average. We have the discounted cash flow techniques. Discounted cash flow technique. Cash flow, discounted cash flow. Or present value of cash flows. So discounted cash flow or present value of future cash flow. As the name suggests, discounted. So asset. Here, the asset or liability must be stated at their present value. That's all. So here, asset to be stated at the present value of the future cash flows to be realized from that asset. So all the money that this asset will produce for you in future terms can find their present value in today's terms. That's all, and put it in. So to be carried out the present value of the future cash flows. Present value of future cash flows. Okay. So what about liability? The same thing. Present value of future cash outflow. So future cash outflow. This one is future cash inflow. So assets will get future cash inflow. Liability will future cash outflow. In that order. Okay, so cash inflow. So assets will be cash inflow, liability will be cash outflow. Okay. That is it. So that is the measurement basis. We are done with the measurement basis. Now let's look at the last section under the uh, conceptual framework to end the conceptual framework and start with the regulatory framework. Good.
Uh, if you do have any questions, kindly ask before we move on to the last section under the conceptual framework. Now, I've seen this conceptual framework. Financial reporting simply means preparation and presentation of financial statements. It's just telling us the rules, the do's and the don'ts in financial reporting. So the first thing we have to know the culture of financial reporting. So if you say you want to be a financial reporter, there are some rules that you have to adhere to. These are the rules. So you have to walk you through all the rules one after the other before we can go in and go and start the report. I believe if you want to be a presenter, not you go now, then you start presenting. No, you have to go to training, go for tutorials, even afterwards, go for practice or practical training. The same thing applies to financial report. Before you can prepare the financial statement, go through some basic principles. And this is what we are doing. Now let's move on to the very last aspect. We call it the concept of capital maintenance. I like that. The concept of what? Capital maintenance. Concept of capital maintenance. It came in 2018 May or sex college max. I read the question. What was the difference between two of the methods? Okay, so the concept of capital maintenance. So the concept of capital and capital maintenance. That's the concept of capital and capital maintenance. Concept of capital and capital maintenance. Now, the conceptual framework here, eh? yes gives a guidance on the capital that the entity wants to maintain. Now the issue is this, it's so simple. We thought, okay, tell us your capital so that we will tell you how to maintain it, that's all. Tell us, define your capital for us so that we will give you how you should maintain it. Good. That's why when you go to the hospital, the doctor will ask you, what's wrong with you? Oh. I was feeling some pain me somewhere. Mm -hmm. What happened? Ah, okay. So now you need this medicine. Where am I? Case closed. We are done. That is how the conceptual framework deal with capital. So we told that when you come, tell us your capital. We will tell you how to maintain it. That is all. So the, the concept of capital and capital maintenance is all about defining your capital and how to maintain it, basically. So here, the conceptual framework defines the capital that the entity seeks to work. Define the capital that the entity seeks to maintain. Good. So the conceptual framework define the capital that the entity seeks to maintain. Great. That is the, the game. So define the capital that the entity seeks to maintain. So you just define find the capital that the entity seeks to maintain, seeks to maintain, good. And also provide a link between capital and profit, wow. I like that the link, the relationship between capital and profit. Who can tell us? So relationship between what? 
capital and profit, what is their relationship? Are they in good terms or they are in bad terms? Good. So are they in good terms or they are in bad terms? Good. So tell us whether they are in good terms or they are in bad terms. Okay, so basically that is it. So that is the concept of the capital maintenance that we talk about. Now let's quickly go through. There are so many types, but we'll look at two. At the question solving stage, I'll come out with the remaining ones. Yeah. We've asked the same question long, long ago, around 2009, 2010, in the corporate reporting. Yes, the final level. So I'll pull all those questions and make them available to you. So, so let's go to the types of the capital maintenance that we have, the types of capital that we have, the types of capital that we have, or the types of uh, the concept of the maintenance, what are the various concepts that we have? There are so many, but we'll talk about two. We have financial capital maintenance, number one. Finance, yeah. Or I call it money. Oh, yes. Money. Financial capital, money capital. Money capital maintenance. I like this. I like this. Money capital maintenance. That is the first one that we have to explain. You should know everything about this. That is all. Good. Here and profit is measured in terms of net asset, increase in net worth assets like that, increase in the money. Your profit is measured in terms of in terms of net asset that is all don't forget that we said that the capital maintenance provide a link between capital and what profit so and here we have to link the profit also between the, your net asset so this is the game here we are saying that mm, you have made a profit mm, if your net asset at the end of the reporting period has increased from that of the beginning period without any contribution made to or made from the owners. That is all. Good. So here we are saying that if the net asset at the start of the year, so net asset, let me start a new line. If your net asset at the start of the year or at the end, so at the end of the reporting period or of the year, the net asset increased from the beginning period, increased without any contribution made made to or from who owners i explained that point very well to you now let's go elementary all of us have done so right as so trader so trader now let's go elementary how do you prepare the data capital section of a so trader 
If I pay trading for the lost account in a balance sheet, so how are you burn it? Let's start. Just with the capital start. Normally, when you read, you write something like this. This is where write the finance by. Aha, very remember, right? So, the finance by people. Let's go. Tell me how you write your finance by. Then come back, come and tell us that capital start of the year. Okay, so much. Plus additional capital into the right? During the year, so much. Add your net profit. Okay, so much. Last word, drawings. So much. I don't believe whatever you get is a capital at close. Closing capital. And this is what you did at a trading profit of loss account level for a sole trader. Good. Now, here we are saying that you have earned a profit. If your net asset at the end, this capital that you have here at the end, this your capital that you have here at the end has not increased as compared to the beginning one. Okay. Without any contribution made to or made from, what is the contribution made to owners? Contribution made to owners are something like the owners are taking money from the business. An owner will take a money. If it's a sole trader, any money that the owner will take away, let's call it drawings. Thank you. If we're a company, the owners cannot come and take money from it by hard, by hard. Now, now I test my sign. So if we're a company, we call it a dividend. So the money given to the owners are the dividend for a company. For sole trader, drawings. So let's take the point again. The company has made a profit again. If the net asset, this capital they have at the end of the year, has increased as compared to the opening one, without any contribution made to or made from users, made from the owners. Now the additional capital into this, we shouldn't count it. We shouldn't count additional capital. We shouldn't count the drawings. So that means level it was the net profit. The company has made a profit. That is what we are talking about. So if we don't consider drawings and any capital injection, capital that was injected in the business during the year, if we don't consider this two, then the company has made it a profit. That's what we were talking about. That is all. We are done with the financial or the money capital maintenance. Let's go to the last one. The last one, we call it the physical capital maintenance. Okay, so let's go to that one. Physical, I mean, yes. Physical So I just have to, I don't write everything again. But there are many. There are many. So the next one is what? Physical. Physical capital maintenance. Capital maintenance. Physical capital maintenance. And the name suggests physical. I also call it what? Operating. That physical or operating. So physical is called operating. So operating capital maintenance. So add a maintenance to it. Okay. So that is it. Yeah. Yeah, we are not going to consider money. No, we don't consider money. Yeah, we consider your uh the physical ability your physical capacity, your physical capability, what you can do, not what you have. Not the money that you have, what you can do with your energy. That is all we are interested in. So here, profit is measured in terms of what? It's measured in terms of operating capacity 
operating or capacity. Yes. In terms of unit produce, in terms of unit productivity, the guy that can produce goods plenty, that guy will make profit. See that you know how to produce a lot. When it comes to productivity, you are the best. So that means you always get profit. That is type. That is what this type is asking us to do. So that is it. So under this, here, the profit is measured in terms of the operating capacity, which is the units, the output. The output. Good. So here too, we are going to start a sentence again by saying that, oh, if make a profit, if the output or the operating capacity or the production capacity or the productivity at the end of the reporting period has increased from that of the beginning of the year without any contribution made to or made from the users or the owners. That is all. So that part must be in them. So that on the same thing. It's the same point just like here. I just going to insert what operating capacity. On that note, we are done with that of the conceptual framework. So thank you very much for completing the conceptual framework. We've gone through all the sections. Great. Now we will look at for the regulatory framework. So I'll start the regulatory framework and see that if we can finish that one too. So that uh, we say first topic cleared, then level the ethics, the ethical concept. With that of the ethics, uh, actually, uh, I'll discuss them at the that intervention stage or at the last meeting period. Okay. So if you do have any question, can we? Uh, put them at the comment section. I'll pick it up and respond to them as soon as possible. If not, then let's continue the game. Let's go to the regulatory framework of financial report. Or regulatory financial report. What we've done so far is a concept, conceptual, is a principle, is a culture, is a behavior aspect, is a practice. Is the assumption, is the phenomenon, is what the practice guidance is the basis. That's what we shall look at it first. Now let's look at the rules and other regulation governing financial report. Oh, there's no rule governing financial reporting. Everybody can just stand up and declare anything, put some few stuff together, present anything. No, you can't do that. You cannot do that. You cannot do that. You can't just put anything together to represent what something. No, you can't do that. Not at all. So the financial reporting usually backed by what? Backed by some news. Because it's regulatory framework. Regulatory framework. Uh, ever on a share report. What we did first is the conceptual framework. This talks about rules and regulations. That's all specific rules that are there to guide financial reporting. That is all specific rules. Okay, now let's start. Uh, when I start the regulatory framework. I'll ask um, this, what are the sorts of laws for financial reporting? Worldwide or country specific? Let's see. So sorts of what? Sources of laws and regulation. For financial reporting, that's all. 
So go back. So if I in Ghana I just put in Ghana in here, so the country that you are coming from, so can also make it um as of general Boba or uh, UK, Canada, Nigeria, South Africa, and so Leon. Can just put it there. So that's it. okay. Now the specific law that states financial reports in the act one, the company's code. So the first one is what the company's code or the company's act. So, so the company's act. So, the company's act. For instance, in Ghana, our company's app is what? At, um, at 2019, at 992, for instance, in Ghana. Great. So this give us the rules and regulation guiding the preparation and presentation of the financial statements. Great. Okay. So that is the game. So the companies have prescribed certain procedure, certain legal procedure that must be adhered to in preparing the financial statement. For instance, the companies have mandate company to prepare accounts each and every year, at least once a year, and it must be audited. So the directors must submit an audited account at least once a year. That is it. So your company's apps. Can talk about the UK's company's apps. Good. And the other ones. Now let's move on to the next one. Number two, the stock exchange or the stock market rules. So stock market. The stock market can also give us some risk covering the financial statement. If you take the listed company, companies that are on the stock market, they have to follow all the stock market rules or the listing rules or the listing requirement. For instance, if on a stock market, if you prepare a financial statement, you have to include the market index, such as what EPS, earnings per share. If you're on a stock market, if you are on the market, or if you're a listed company, if you prepare financial statement, it can must what you do your EPS or your DPS, the listed and special in it. But more if you're a private company, don't need all this stuff. So give us some talk of it. Number three. We can talk about directives. Directives from where? From AU, Africa Union. African Union. That should belong to African Union or European Union. Good. So you can get instructions coming from there, then you move on. Number four, I may talk about. Industrial specific industry, but normally we don't pay much more attention to that industry. Industrial rules, or such as the Industrial Act, the industry that it belongs to, there's act that governs that. So let's see if we're company, but you are the financial institution. There was an act that governed the financial institutions in a country, like Bank of Ghana's Act, 
Good. Special deposit taking institutions act in that order. So we should take note the industry that belong to have a specific act that governs them. It gives some spare some reporting needs that need to be adhered to. Uh, can I change some part and then start? Let me continue from here. Mm. So number five. Number five is a conceptual framework. Number five is a conceptual framework. So to give us room. Conceptual framework. You got it. Number six is the IFRS. So International Financial Reporting Standards. The IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards. Also give us some specific rules. So these are the source of what laws and regulation for that of the financial reporting, specifically in most countries, including Ghana. Okay. Now let's see. Uh, companies are doing it here. Yeah. Stock market, no. Charity, no. Natural rules, no. Consumer framework, we are done with it. So, what level is the IFR? So, in fact, the central focus of the regulatory framework, that particular topic, is all about IFR. That is all. We try to give you the other areas of the regulation. Good. So now let's see, why do you think there must be a need for regulation? That's the first question you have to ask you. I could have just allowed anything I prepare, it's okay. Anything I prepare, it's okay. Imagine what will happen. If they are not even, when they are rules, they are remix. Why they are rules, class? So, So imagine that there are no specific rules guiding financial reporting. They will just put anything together to present something new. Good. So here, the need of regulatory framework is to protect the interest of the investors. To protect investors, that's all. To protect what? Who? Investors. Now, if um, a foreign investor deciding to probably invest in the domestic market, like coming maybe from outside different country, coming to your country to invest. You will first of all ask the question, this country I thought, do they have a regulatory framework? They have a laws that bind their financial reporting or anybody can just put something together to represent something, right? that um, the funds will not be utilized or used efficiently. Good. So every country wants to protect the foreign investor and local investors too as well. So like they have to tell you that yes, there are laws in the country that guys how financial statements are prepared. So they bring your money. When your money is in our country, you are safe. Your money is safe because there are laws, a lot of laws govern the financial thing. So no one can just do something fishy to represent something and then come for your money. No. So that is it. Now let's start. Now I want to talk about IFRS and IESH in general for the next 30 minutes ahead of us. IESH and IFRS are the financial reporting standards. I want to talk about them. So the financial reporting standards, that ones are specific rules. These ones are all specific. Specific, right? Specific treatment. What about the conceptual framework? That one give us what? A general guidance. I like this term. General treatment. 
That is why the standard talks about one particular item at a time. That is why the standard does not talk about everything. But more particular people talk about everything. General. I we get the difference, right? Good. All the same, this one supersede the requirement of IFRS is supersede the requirement of what the conceptual framework. IFRS is, is the boss. Conceptual framework for many days. Meanwhile, it was the conceptual framework that did that what I yes. Oh yes. This one we call it student outweigh the lecture. Okay, so now let's go through how who even set these standards, how they set it. It's important and we are done for the game. Who set this, how they set it, was the objective and not all. Then the important. Now, um, these standards, before they set it, uh, something happened. There are some big boss, I call them the big boss. We call them IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standard Foundation, IFRS World Foundation. IFRS World Foundation. Now, but let me write it to National Capital. National Capital. IFRS Foundation. Um, they're supposed to prepare the standard, the IFRS. They're supposed to issue the standards. But they so, can we set a board so that the board will, will prepare the standard? on us because we have a lot of responsibility to run. So can we have a team that will do it on our behalf? So something that you have to do to good. Your work that you have to do, you go some team to do the work for you. If you employ some team to do the work for you. So they employ some team here. We call them international accounting standards. Ball. So the IFRS Foundation got some board, form a board so that this board will now do our work for us. So they form the board. Now, what happened is this one, they form the board, right? So they appoint members onto the board, they fund the board. They govern the board and what they oversee the activities of the board. So these are the specific functions of the IFRS Foundation, the big boss. I call them big boss. In fact, they also have their boss. Oh, oh yes, everybody have boss. Yes, they have their boss. They are head in the monetary board. Monetary board. Good. They supervise IFRS Foundation. So everyone in the board, so they also have their own, their own, but we want a branch. Although the head is the IFAC, the International Federation of what, Chartered or International Federation of Accountants, both. Not about the Chartered Accountant, they will. The accountant. So the IFRS Foundation will appoint members onto the board, fund the board. Of course, if they appoint members, they can't do that. Just that here, the issue is everybody have duration. Your time of office. When they appoint you, you can have four years, seven years, six years. When your time is expired, you leave the system. That is how it works. So not like uh, they just manipulation and then take it. No, not at all. So when I appoint you, you have your time that will expire. You will leave the system. So, fund, govern, oversee. Now, if someone do all these things for you, what do you do to the person in the form of return? If our parents pay our fees, give us food, give us protection, security, and pay the fees, we go to school, what is it going to happen? 
That's why when I am, they post your results straight to daddy. Yes, so they have to post the report. You have to report back to your boss. So you pull a report here. Good. So reports. So the IAB have to report to the IFRS Foundation. So report. So that is it. Now, the IAB, their main function is to prepare and issue the IFRS. Now, when I mention the IFRS, it means, it also means the IAS. I'll explain later on what is the difference. That is it. Now, the IAB currently, there are 13 member boards. 13 member boards. And the board is chaired by an European representative. Good. 13 member boards. That is the thing. Now, the foundation, I find foundation like that this book cannot work alone. No. So we need some supporting staff that will provide help to these. So the IFRS Foundation set up what we call an interpretation committee. So we call it IFRS IC. That means IFRS Interpretation Committee. Another team. What to be their main function? They have to interpret the standards issued by all the, the board, provide an explanatory note of the standards because sometimes some of the standards are too technical. I have some of these standards in here. The rest of if we quote it for you, the interpretation is quite really challenging. So they have to now provide more money to it. Then again they say no. They have to also form another one again so that they provide advice. So we call them IFRS Advisory Council, AC. So they form another team. That team, they are responsible to solely advise the board when they are setting their standards. So that is the structure of the IFRS Foundation. When they ask you for the structure of the IFRS Foundation, this is the structure of the IFRS Foundation. I have a foundation that not work on alone. It's a team made by the board, foundation committee, and then advisory council. That is it. Okay. Now this are uh, the team. Now let's look at this game. Let's look at this. Let's look at this. Okay, so now we look at the functions of all these people. It will provide an explanatory note, interpret the financial provides interpret the financial reporting standards and provide more meanings to this, although the board has approved that thing. Yes. Advisory council, as usual, they have to provide some consultation service to, uh, to the board. The board, they have to provide incident. Now, even though all of them have a different role to play or duty or tax, they have a common objective, something that you're supposed to do, and you employ someone to do it for you, then your objective and that person's objective must be the same. You have common objective. So that means these people, IFRS Foundation, and then the board, they have what common objectives. So what are the objectives? I write them down here and the summary form. In the material, I have the full version of all the objectives. So to get a full picture, 
when you're going through the material, you get a full point in there. Over here, summary, summary point, the key point in the objective. That is what I will present here for you. Okay. So let's look at the objective. So objective, let's write it in here. Number one, objective number one. So the objective, for instance, let me give you five good objectives. Have you seen the, your professional body and then yourself and myself? All of us have a different role to play, but our objective are the same, to raise what? A professional accountant in the system. So my role is probably break the terms down for you to understand. And when your role is, go and sit down, prepare and write the exams. And then the professional body, their role is get examination team conducted and then award certificates that is all so have you seen our functions that we play they are different but objectives are the same to train and to bring out qualified accountants that is all okay so the objective number one this is your objective as well. to produce high quality Globally acceptable financial reporting standard. So to produce high quality, globally acceptable financial reporting standard. To produce what high quality, globally acceptable financial reporting standard. To produce high quality, globally acceptable financial reporting standard. That is the first objective. This one, their dream, and this one, their dream is that they will produce high quality and then globally acceptable financial reporting standards. Number two, point number two. Point number two, or objective number two. These are the summary. Of, okay. Point number two. Now, when I finish the production of the IFRS, they have to also import it or its feasibility. So, to promote the use of the IFRS, that's the second objective. Promote what? The use of the IFRS. Use of the IFRS. Yes, make sure that a lot of people use the IFRS. Don't produce it and put that one side and then sleep over it, no. Then, three. The objective is to limit the alternative treatment of the accounting transaction. To limit what? The alternative treatment or to prevent alternative treatment of accounting transactions. Good. So, um, they have to make sure that they give us a standardized way, one, to limit any other. Because sometimes you put a transaction there and call, let's say, different accountant, and they also come up with what different treatment. So their objective is that, no. In fact, after the IFRS, if you call five accountants or different accountants from different countries, they should give us the same treatment, not different treatment. That was what the objective. Okay. That is it. Now there are many ones in, it's in the material. So you will probably go through them. So that we move on. I'm done. And let me go straight to the point. Now we're going to look at the IAS and the IFRS itself. Let me two topics for us to finish this regulatory framework. The regulatory framework lies on this diagram that you see here. So that's what we're going to do next. So can you take them carefully for me and then you'll be fine. Now let's move on. Now, the standards, why is that? Uh, some are called IASs and some are called IFRS. IFRS. Mm. Some are called IAS, some are called IFRS. Don't worry. Let's see why I just like that. Okay. 
Now, in 1966, something happened. A group of expert accountants realized that they should have what um, some sort of principles or rules govern the financial reporting in their locality. And they thought it wise to extend it to the international use. I thought, wow, that's good news. Okay, so that's the genesis, that's the starting point of the IAS. So from 1966, it's no issue in standard. Mm -hmm. No standard issue. So no standard. So in 1973, that is where they started preparing the standards. Started issuing the standard. By the third when it issued in 1973. But the first one issue became effective in 1975. Don't need all this issue, please. Okay. Now, from 73, the standard that they issue, they call it international accounting standard. So from 73, they issued international accounting standard. That is the standard that they started issue. So they started issue one, two, three, up to 41. Wow, they did well. They did extremely well. So, but first April, first April, 2001, something happened there. First April 2001, something happened. What happened in first April? They realized that some of the standard issues in 70s, 80s, and 90s were no longer applicable in real terms. They were outmoded. They were out of use. The requirement does not uh gives a realistic value so it needs to be what amended updated revised that was the agenda okay so they started revising the outmoded ones some of them were cancelled some of them were updated so when they Cancel a standard like this that oh no, no longer apply. Good. Great. So now, if they want to replace the outmoded ones or the out of use standards, then they will call it what IFRS, International Financial Reporting standards so the financial reporting standards are standard that they prepare and issue after 2001 first april because you realize that some of the old standards or some of the standard issue previously were no longer applied so but why they don't call it IA? they say financial reporting because at the inception of this program we stated that uh, accounting means record skipping and financial reporting means you are paying financial business. So this one sound a bit matured or a bit like well, well explained to financial reporting, like a bit well than accounting. Accounting is low, FR is a bit higher than accounting. That's what they go in for it. So they start the issue. Um, IFRS 1, 2. Currently, we have IFRS 16 in issue. They are down 17. Very soon, they'll publish it and we'll start using it. Okay. That is it. So, in short, IFRS is our standard that they issue after 2001. Some of them were issued to replace old standards, some of them too were issued on their own. Good. And then the IASs are the first set of the standard issue. 
very soon, all the IAS, they will cancel them and they will be replaced by IAS viruses. That is why the IAS are not in order. Some of them have been deleted or canceled. The IAS viruses is in order from one up to 16. Good. So that is it. Okay. Now let's continue the game. So that's the few differences. So after 2001, take note that even though they started 73, 73, the first time I was issued is 75. Yes, in 2001, the first one was issued in 2003. I first one was issued in 2003 in that order. So maybe all this is the no. Yes, I'm not asking. Okay, so now let's look at the um, advantages of international harmonization and then the advantages of the standard itself. I'll do that one as a trial work. The advantages of the IFRSs itself and then the advantages of the international harmonization. Here we are saying that the standards must be harmonized all over the world. So that means every country to be a good ground, they must adopt the IFR. So the question is, if every country adopts the IFR, what will be the good news? What will be the advantage if this standard get harmonized? Okay, so that, that means the good news will be, so we call it advantages of international harmonization, right? advantages of international harmonization of the IFRS. If the IFRS is being harmonized or used all over the world, what will be the importance? What will be the advantage that we can, the benefit that we can derive? Number one, I'll cut it short. It will improve comparability. So, improves comparability. So, or uh, it improves comparability. So, improves comparability. Okay, so the financial statement prepared by companies at different countries can be compared to obtain what performance. Good. Two, we can also say that for transfer of staff, transfer of what of staff, counting staff. Good. An accountant in South Africa can also be an accountant of Sierra Leone, can also be an accountant of UK, because the standard of reporting is the same. If we use IFRS in these countries, you can just remove it. Look at the audit firms, how they move their audit partner from one country to the other. Good. Now, currently, we have over 100 countries using IFRS. Over 100 countries using IFRS. That is the good news. Now let's see. Point number three, easy access of finance. Easy access of what? Finance. Access of finance. Number four. Now, easy access of finance simple means if um, we adopt IFRS. Uh, if I'm going for finance, it should not be too difficult because you are using the international system to prepare your accounts. So basically, any international financial institution will be ready to advance or finance or provide the needed support that you need. That is the good news. Good. Then for multinational companies to 
for expansion 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 you can expand to foreign territories that having difficulty in reporting difficulty in reporting because the standard of reporting is basically the same okay now let's continue the game and number five uh, we can talk about the importance of the eye viruses but this point five talks about the importance of the eye virus the a there will be accountability which will improve or it will enhance accountability and then transparent reporting so there will be what accountability let me put a term here Come on. there are different terms all together so let me write in here six but let me break them down six there will be some level of transparent reporting. Number seven, efficient. Efficient or efficiency. Good. So these are the, for the last three are important of the eye viruses, the benefit of eye viruses. So accountability, transparent, and efficiency. Good. So that is it. Now let's look at the challenges that we have with these eye viruses. The challenge serves as barrier to certain group or certain country or certain institution. So the disadvantage of the standard of the eye viruses would deter someone to adopt it. So in a way, we call this topic barrier to international harmonization. It's basically talking about there's some difficulty that we have with the IFRS. That is a barrier to international harmonization. So barrier to international harmonization. Let's look at that one to end. Uh, yeah. Barrier to international harmonization barrier to international harmonization so let's look at that very one after that let me last topic then we are done for the regulatory framework so we are saying that uh there's gonna come with some little little challenge and this little challenge some country will depend on it and it will work out the harmonization process so let's look at the barriers or the disadvantage so areas of the international harmonization not so let's consider the barrier number one ah uh, here yeah. to so we'll talk about different legal systems different legal system different legal system good that's a bad barrier you know countries have different legal systems so if that if their legal system does not support the ifrs or contradicts with the ifrs uh they will not adopt to the ifrs we say that this IFRS may contradict your local laws, your legal system. For instance, currently in Ghana, the IFRS 10, IFRS 10, conflict with our company's code, a part. There's a section stated in the IFRS which contradicts what the company's code is also saying. So if you have a lot of contradictions, you adopt the IFRS is low. Because you suffered before you go to legal system. Taking company like 
countries like UK, for instance. UK uses what we call the principle based approach. Principle based approach. US also uses what? The rule based approach. So these systems are not the same. But the IFRS is also uses the principle based approach. IFRS is about principle which support the UK system and also support the Ghana system. Ghana will also use what? The principle based approach. By US, use the rule based rule based approach. So, which might not be compatible with it. So, different legal systems. And then two different culture. Different culture or culture differences. Culture differences. Just a subset of this. If your culture does not support the requirement of the IFRS for me, the culture in that country. Yeah. Know that nothing can change Chinese man from using his chopping sticks, right? Even though they made the golden spoons to be disposed of or to be sold to the African market and other European markets, but they still prefer their work, their chopping sticks. So nothing will, will let them throw that culture away. So Statement. Number three, we can talk about the need of developing country. Need of developing country. Because of this point, I'm not expecting any developing country to adopt the IFR. Developing country. Countries that they are now coming, small, 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 small. They don't need the IFRSs. Developing countries don't need IFRS. Because why? IFRS will not solve their poverty. IFRS, IFRS will not solve the portal, the bad rules, the insecurity, the injustice. And this are found in this country. The IFRS will not solve it. Developing countries, what they need is not the IFRS. So even if you bring the IFRS to a common floor or very cheap, you price it at cheapest level, they will never ask, even ask for the price because it's what they don't need. They don't even dream about it. Why? If that country is seriously in poverty, if you're hungry, we get them to go and report. What are you going to report at all? So that is the that country. So if there's a country now coming, and you are selling IFRSs, forget them. No matter what you do, not adopt it. Why? Now, countries supposed to, these countries, what they are interested in is the primary activities, the extractive industries, or the extraction sectors, farming. That's why you see most of the developing countries are in what? Farming. Most. So, farming. Then after the farming, they will now move to the industry. That's the second cycle of the manufacturing or the industry. So they will farm, farm, produce a lot of raw materials. And then right after the production of raw material, they now build factories to process them. So after processing, then they will not think of what tertiary. That is where they will think of what service, adding service to it. And that's where now they have to, now they are getting money, they are selling, they are getting money. So they need auditors to come and then audit their staff. They need bankers to come and then be with them, all the session. So that is the series. So this IFRS is at what stage? It's at the third stage, if that guy is here. You will not accept it. Good. Now, now, point number four talks about 
I'll talk about nationalism. Nationalism. One country is not ready to accept other countries, I think. That's what we are facing now. One country is not ready to accept the other countries item. So one country is not ready to accept the other countries item. So US, for instance, US has not adopted the IFRS. Probably, and I don't say that probably is coming from where UK. You got to say no, this IFRS is uh, it's developed by non-governmental organization. That is the, the board. The IFAC is just uh, eight memberships about countries, not just one country for many. You guys also thought, okay, well, um, it was originated from there. So probably this, the route is coming there and even pick the governance structure of that country. So basically, that is it. So as a result of that, you know what's going on? A team was sent to analyze the US, their standard, we call it US GAP. Analyze the US reporting standard that the US GAP to know the difference between the US GAP and the IFRS. So that when they report back the differences, you will delete all those differences from the IFRS so automatically. There will not be any difference between IFRS and US GAP. So that now we all use one reporting standards. So that is the, the plan or the agenda now. So that is it. Now let's go to the next point. We can talk about cost of training and retraining. Cost of training. And retraining. If uh, we don't have funds in a country, a country is so poor, or uh, we are in critical moments. Uh, our last funds, should we use our last funds to train someone while we are in difficult situation? So if you consider the cost involved, training professors at the various university, training lecturers, conferences, training packages, seminars, workshop, if you calculate the cost, and this cost outweigh the benefit. What do you do? You boycott it. Because if that country is seriously in need, uh, they will not adopt it. In fact, if you check the Western countries, most of the primary needs are catered for. Most of the Western country, the primary needs are catered for. So, but when you come to the developing countries, the primary needs are not catered for. Security is not there. The food, shelter are not there. Are not so common as compared to the Western world, where these ones are so common. Basic is basic. So when someone is crying over food, you are crying over what? Over technology. So until the person is satisfied, before the person now think about technology. You are done eating and then not taking about technology. So look at the difference. So, like the level is not the same. Good. So, probably they cannot force where they are on the Africa countries. That is it. Then, six, you can talk about lack of strong accountancy body, lack of strong. Accountancy body. If that country does not have a strong accountancy body to enforce this, they will not accept the IFRS. Yeah, so that's the barriers. Okay.
Okay, so these are some of the few ones in the material I provided most of them there. So you can look at it. Unfortunately for us, this is how far the good Lord will bring us. On that note, we will continue again in our next meeting. Great. But if you do have any questions, kindly uh, put them at the comment section. If you have not subscribed to, kindly subscribe. Share the link to your friends. So waiting for questions from you. Great.